Hi, I'm, I'm Thomas Small, the mayor of Culver City, and I'm so happy to see you all here. Um, I, as I mentioned, I see Vice Mayor Megan Sally Wells out there. Who else should I recognize out there? We have my colleague Alex Fish on the city council. And any, anybody else jump up who wants me to point them out. I see various members of our Kelly Kent, uh, vice president of our school board, and various, various members of our general plan advisory committee. So delighted to have you, all of you here. Um, but we're incredibly fortunate tonight to have have uh, my, my friend Christopher Hawthorne joining us for the, the fourth in our prelude series of our uh, leading up to our general plan. Um, I think Christopher has, has, probably, has, has thought with greater depth and breadth about the, 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 the history and the state of Los Angeles and, and the region, and most importantly, the future of, of Los Angeles and the region. He, he, has, he has penetrated that, I think, maybe more than anyone else in, you know, in, in his writing uh, and, in, and in, in, in various parts of his work. He's made uh, you know, what, what could be a disastrous transition from, from working for the LA Times, for being uh, the much admired architecture critic of the LA Times for many years to becoming the, uh, going to the dark side, working for a city as the, as the uh, chief design officer of the city of Los Angeles. Um, so to have him here in Culver City helping us imagine our future is an incredible privilege for all of us. So Christopher, come on, come on, come on, come on up and join us. Brent, is there anything else I'm forgetting? No, you covered it. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, hello, everybody. Good evening. Thanks for coming out um, on a rainy night. I want you to know that I am missing the LA City Department of City Planning holiday party to be with you tonight. So you all collectively owe, owe, owe me a drink um, to be repaid at, at some other to be repaid at some other time. Um, so um, the mayor, as part of this process, um, asked me uh, along with Brent to say a few words, and the last thing I want to do is come to Culver City and tell a bunch of Culver City residents how to think about your city, and that is absolutely not my intention. I thought what I would try to do is put the conversation that you're now engaged in in, um, in the context of what I'm thinking about and working on in my office and, and the trends and the conversations and the themes that I'm seeing um, on a national and indeed international level. Um, because what you're doing here is of course connected with what we're doing in the city of LA and in the region at a moment when Los Angeles, just from the city side, is also um, um, rethinking some of these basic frameworks. Um, the recode effort, for example, to um, rewrite our zoning code in a comprehensive way for the first time since 1946. We're also engaged in rewriting all of the community plans across the city, the first of which for downtown will be, uh, will be rolling out relatively soon. Uh, looking ahead to the Olympics in 2028, of course, um, and thinking about what the transit investments in uh, Measure M will look like for the city and region. Um, so for all those reasons, it does feel, and this is one of the reasons I decided to make this leap from the LA Times and take this job in the mayor's office, it does feel like this is a moment where quite a bit hangs in the balance and there are a lot of very consequential decisions that all of the cities um, in the county really will be making over the next five to ten years that will really shape, in terms of the built environment of the city, I think will really shape and reshape Los Angeles for the next couple of generations. Um, and I don't know that we've been at a moment quite so pivotal for many decades. And so I certainly think of what's happening here, as does the mayor, um, uh, your mayor, in the context of, of some of these larger regional questions. Um, so I thought I would talk, um, they, Brent asked me to speak for 30 to 45 minutes or so. I'm going to try to be on the shorter end of that, frankly, because I'm more interested in the conversation uh, with, with the councilman and the mayor that we will, we will have following a few images. And I also made a point, as I typically try to do, of trying to keep this very short on charts and graphs and um, bigger on themes and imagery, so to give you some things to think about to help frame perhaps the conversation that you're already engaged in and will be moving uh, more directly into in the next year or so uh, in Culver City. So I do um, balancing three things in two hands. So um, so I, I did start um, uh, with the, 
the theme of this effort, Think About Tomorrow Today, I think it's important to um, start by thinking about yesterday a little bit, even when it's difficult. And I have to say, one of the projects that I've been working on in, oh, thank you so much, that's perfect, um, that I've been thinking about in my own office is, is uh, one of the privileges of my new job is the ability to convene conversations and bring together thinkers, writers, um, artists, architects whom I admire to help me think through some basic questions. And one of the things I'll be doing starting next year is to bring together a sort of committee on memory with historians and architects and artists to think about a better framework from a design point of view with dealing with really sites that have uh, layers of history or fraught history. We have had a tendency in Los Angeles, as you all know, when confronted with sites like that, to kind of pursue a tabula rasa solution and not really grapple with the complexities of the history. I think that's true to a certain degree in every city, but I think it's per perhaps more acute in Los Angeles than in other places. So I think it's always important to, to start with a little bit of history, particularly in terms of how uh, zoning and, and uh, approaches to land use, all the things that you'll begin to grapple with, at least in the land use portion of your general plan. So there, we're at a moment in the last two or three years where there has been really remarkable uh, scholarship about the history of the way that cities have been organized from a land use zoning, planning, housing point of view. Um, uh, starting, I think, a couple of years ago with this fantastic Richard Ross steambook. How many of you have, have read some or all of it? Show of hands. Okay, so pretty good, pretty good number. Um, and, that, and, and this history of, uh, of redlining um, includes, of course, Culver City as a sundown town and um, one of the population statistics that um, I found uh, striking, although will not, you know, this is probably familiar to most of you, um, uh, the population in 1930 of Culver City, anybody want to guess what the population was in 1930? 5,689 of which there were um, zero African American residents in that census. 1940, 8,976 residents, four African Americans. Um, by 1960, when the population had really ballooned, had jumped relatively close to where it is today, uh, past 30,000, 32,163, there were still just 35 African American residents in the city. So um, um, it's a history that is as uh, acute and important um, uh, and difficult here as it is anywhere. Um, there is also, of course, um, um, Matthew Desmond's book um, about the kind of, um, let's say, rental industrial complex and the ways that some of those zoning decisions in terms of who is a renter and who's a homeowner in this country continue to play out um, in, in terms of equity in particular and household wealth. Um, also, again, confronting a lot of the most difficult uh, uh, racial and other legacies of this country, which certainly Los Angeles County has not been immune to. And then I'll point you, those of you, if you don't know this book by Kelly Hernandez, who teaches at UCLA. Oh, fantastic. Even better. Um, good. Um, uh, confronting, again, from my point of view, as someone who thinks about architecture and design, the way in which um, incarceration has really been written into the fabric of the city um, and is uh, something that in the same way we have to confront this history of redlining is absolutely central to thinking about um, where, we, um, where we can rethink the ways that we have organized the, the city in a very basic way in terms of um, in terms of, of basic fairness as the, as the question of, of mass incarceration it gets, I think, really productively wrapped up in conversations now about planning land use architecture in ways that it has not been historically. So, um, so again, these are all issues that are um, uh, connected to the history of Culver City that just as they are connected to the history of the city of Los Angeles, where I work and indeed the whole um, the whole region is a bit of a lag, so bear with me. But, but in some other ways, I think the history of the, of the region in terms of architecture, indeed of land use, can be instructive and can be a model. Um, I think particularly um, a figure like Irving Gill, an architect who, beginning in San Diego and then moving into Los Angeles County um, uh, by the middle teens, 
was producing architecture as fair, um, uh, really as proto-modernist as anything. At the same time, even earlier than those experiments were happening in Europe with the Bauhaus, um, continues to be a really underappreciated figure. And I mention him in this context because a lot of his most interesting, interesting experiments were in what we would now call workforce housing or uh, multifamily projects. Um, he was doing big houses for wealthy clients like the Dodge House, which was on Kings Road until it was um, sadly demolished in the 1970s, right up the street from, uh, from the Schindler House. But he was also doing all kinds of experiments in multifamily and workers' housing uh, across the region. This is the Horatio West Court project in Santa Monica um, from 1919, again, mixing um, some influences of of, of Spanish style in the in the arches, but um, but also in its uh, in its really in its economy and its in, in the spareness of the architecture, really um, as experimental in its modernism as anything as I mentioned that's happening in Europe, and also in terms of um, a model for how we uh, live on the land. A really interesting example: four two-story units toward the front, um, two smaller units in the back, so six units on a pretty small piece of land with this uh, sort of driveway and a little garage in the back. Cars were quite a bit smaller back then. Um, but this kind of model, you know, I think we tend to forget because of the way in which um, the imagery of the single family house in the post-war um, era begins to take hold and really begins to suggest the appeal of Los Angeles itself and California itself in the post-war decade. So this kind of imagery the David Hockney paintings. Um, um, interestingly, the one that's sold for a record amount at auction is not Los Angeles, uh, although it looks like a, a, a pool in the, in the hills. Um, or this image um, from a little bit earlier, Julia Shulman's famous photograph of Case Study 22, the stall house by Pierre Koenig in the Hollywood Hills, um, arguably the most uh, famous architectural photograph of the 20th century. And I show it again in this context to suggest the appeal, the power, the glamour of this kind of imagery as connected to the single family house was so strong that it helped us as a region really forget those experiments that Gill, Schindler, um, Neutra, all of the most important modernist architects had been pursuing in multifamily work in the pre-war decades, not to mention the great bungalow courts across the region, all of these other experiments in multifamily housing. Um, but this produced, these, this imagery produced a kind of amnesia about that earlier work and convince not just the rest of the country and the world, but many Angelinos in some way in terms of the civic conversation that this was a city, in the same way that we tend to think that the city was organized around the car, forgetting um, the, the streetcar system um, that predated the arrival of the freeway and the private car, we tend to think sometimes of Los Angeles as a city of housing, a city organized around the notion of the single family house, of course, forgetting those earlier experiments um, uh, by Gill and, and others. I will say, though, that recently it's a different version of the um, Shulman photographs from that series that has caught my attention. This is um, Julius himself, who I was lucky enough to get to know a little bit at the end of his life. And I love in this image how he's sort of perched on this wall the same way that the house is perched on the hillside. Um, and then this is my favorite bit, his assistant helpfully holding up a a bit of greenery to give the photograph some context, um, and that's something that he did quite often. He also frequently drove around with furniture in the back of his uh, truck so that he could furnish the houses um, um, uh, be better than they were sometimes. Um, but he frequently would cut off branches and do this kind of uh, photography. Um, but this is, I show this also because this is sort of how I'm feeling now, seeing a little bit how the sausage is made in my new position uh, rather than the finished product of what. Um, uh, what an architecture critic sees right when he or she is reviewing a project uh, when it's done. But the power of this series of images, the photographs that Julia Shulman took of a number of important modern uh, modernist houses in the post-war decades really did change the way that we thought about the relationship of residential life to the larger region here, um, even as the growth of the freeway network was sort of um, changing the way we thought about uh, mobility in a similar way. So, um, and that brings us uh, closer to the present day. I've often started lectures about Los Angeles by pairing these two images. So 
the Shulman image of the Stallhouse on the left with an image of the really remarkable immigration rights marches that happened in 2006, not, after, not long after I arrived in Los Angeles, which um, suggested a sort of not only a demographic shift, this is happening in 2006, just as the population in LA County is becoming majority Latino, um, the population in LA City um, uh, not far behind, but also that that demographic shift would have implications in terms of um, how uh, Angelinos were interested in using the public spaces of the city. And this image in particular has always been really striking, is taken from uh, by a former colleague of mine at the LA Times from um, one of the uh, terraces at the LA Times building. Um, this is a crowd that marched in the hundreds of thousands down Wilshire and down Broadway and downtown. Um, and then ma uh, met in, en masse at the base of City Hall. Of course, there's no traditional plaza or civic square there, but the crowd sort of uh, just glommed amoeba-like around the base of the tower um, and suggested, as I mentioned, this kind of new interest in using the public spaces of the city in a more active and different way, as opposed to this image, which really suggests that the glamour of this architecture is directly related to its detachment right from the rest of the city that this view, that this you know sort of ideal, of course, white male uh, homeowners stand in for all the buyers of those houses after the war. Um, no one has done a study, although I wish somebody would, about whether there are covenants on the Stallhouse property and sort of what the history of that piece of land is. And I think it would be fascinating in the context of the work that Rothstein and others have done to, to do that. But of course, this white male standing in for home ownership in Los Angeles, looking out at the base and it's, you know, at, um, at, at his feet and the way in which um, the appeal of this sort of lifestyle is its detachment from the city and the kind of paradox of Los Angeles post-war architecture, which is that the quintessential Los Angeles buildings are those that are sort of exist at arm's length from the city itself. Um, and there, there are countless examples of that. I think of the, um, a number of the case study houses as sort of uh, occupying that sort of territory, the Eames House and Studio uh, in the Palisades certainly qualifies. So there has been, I think, a shift um, perhaps best epitomized by, by these two images toward a city that's much more engaged and a region much more engaged in its public spaces. Now looking to the future, we're also in a, you know, cities across the country and around the world um, are squeezed now with two kinds of uncertainty. And the first and, and most important is, is climate uncertainty, thinking about the implications of climate change for, um, for those cities in terms of not just natural disaster, but also how we build, how we live, how we get around, and then technology, which I'll talk about a little bit. So I think the, the changes um, that both of those forces pretend for American cities and urbanism writ large is really the profound question for those of us who work on cities and city making to think about. Um, and of course, the latest, uh, the latest um, news about uh, climate projections has been, um, ha has been increasingly dramatic, increasingly dire. And we in Southern California don't necessarily need to look at those statistics to understand what that means, given the way that wildfires um, have been racing across the region. In fact, there's something, I'm sure some of you saw the amazing photographs taken on the beach. Uh, there was one photograph taken by an LA Times photographer of two llamas who were tied to a lifeguard stand. There's something about a wildfire that doesn't extinguish until, itself until it reaches the Pacific Ocean that I think really suggests uh, the impotence that we, that we have now in trying to shape, trying to contend with um, the, the kind of wildfires and other natural disasters that will be increasingly produced by um, by climate change, not to mention the, the, the sea level rise question. Another part of that, of course, in the larger context is, is, uh, is rising ocean temperatures. Um, and there has begun to be a, a conversation, actually, and some of you may have heard a little bit about this speculation, that because of um, rising temperatures in the, in the Pacific off of Los Angeles, that we may actually begin to see hurricanes coming up from Mexico and making landfall in places like Santa Monica within, according to some research I've seen, within 20 or 30 years. Now there's still some, you know, some disagreement among the climate scientists about that, um, uh, but certainly the implications don't have to just do with, uh, with wildfire or even with sea level rise. There, you know, the conversation about hurricanes, which when I came to Los Angeles, I never thought those two words would be 
um, you know, that, that LA and hurricanes would be uttered in the same sentence, but that, that's the brave new world that we're moving into. Um, at the same time, uh, technology, as I mentioned, is beginning to reshape cities in all kinds of ways. And what, one thing that's changed quite dramatically in the time that just in the last five years or so is this question has moved, this question of what um, big technology companies will mean for urbanism, for example, um, has shifted from, uh, for example, how smartphones have changed how we think about, how we look at, and how we move through cities, right? To the big tech companies actually moving directly into the business of city making or planning. So some of that has played out recently with Amazon and the sort of HQ2 bake off and across American cities. Um, but also, this is an image from Toronto of a project that Sidewalk Labs, which is an offshoot of, of Alphabet, which is the Google parent company, is beginning to pursue in Toronto um, in a piece of waterfront land where it is trying to create. Um, a, a sort of test city of tomorrow where it can collect all kinds of data um, about how people live, how they move through, how they communicate in, in this kind of a city. Um, and it's interesting, just from an architectural point of view, the notion is to use um, limber, uh, sorry, cross laminated timber, timber high rises, which is a, a material that is, um, uh, has a huge amount of promise in terms of its sustainable properties, but is not yet approved in those cities uh, from a planning point of view, but where a lot of research is happening. Uh, in fact, the Universal Studios project, uh, which has been um, uh, engaging a, a, an architecture firm from Portland, has been pursuing some of the earliest experiments in that kind of construction in Los Angeles. But uh, we are beginning to see tech companies really move directly, as I said, into urban planning and think about redesigning chunks, whole chunks of cities. Um, with all of the anxiety and trepidation, right, uh, about that sort of de data collection and surveillance that um, you can imagine comes with um, that sort of a project. And I, I was just in uh, Abu Dhabi and Dubai in the United Arab Emirates leading an LA Times sponsored tour actually on the architecture and design of the Emirates uh, and was able to make a visit, a return visit, um, for the first time in almost a decade to this project, which is called Mazdar City, which is the um, uh, project in Abu Dhabi that the Emirate there um, invested a huge amount of money in to test out a number of green technologies as they relate to building and city making. In some ways, it's been a huge failure. It has not expanded and, gr and grown the way that the uh, leaders of Abu Dhabi imagined it would. Um, the architecture of this sort of central core uh, it has held up pretty well. And in fact, the way it works most successfully really relies on really old fashioned lessons about uh, the space between buildings being very narrow, um, providing a kind of architectural shade. Um, and, and in terms of scale and in looking back to an almost medieval sort of land use pattern, it's really uh, uh, has held up remarkably well. Other parts of the experiment have not. The entire city um, district was meant to be built on a plinth with um, a circulation and kind of transportation system um, underneath. Um, sorry. I get a preview of Scott Winner. Um, so underneath those buildings, um, there is this uh, a sort of early experiment in autonomous vehicles, um, these cars that, uh, take, that handle four passengers um, and, and are operated on this um, track. And they have the benefit of not having to worry about pedestrians uh, or any other obstacles, which is really what AB is really struggling with at the moment in cities, right? Because they've been completely evacuated of people and they run on an emptied space below the buildings. Um, but they're about to be taken out of service because the Mazdar city is so small that everybody has realized that if they just park their car on the periphery and walk in, they will get there much more quickly than waiting for uh, one of these uh, little cars. But I was lucky enough to take a ride. This is um, a couple weeks ago in Abu Dhabi, um, just before they were about to be retired. So I felt lucky to be able to have taken part in that sort of back to the future experiment of what we thought autonomous travel might look like, at least, at, least in the, at least in the Emirates. So um, th this is an image that, you know, this is a topic that comes up in every conversation about cities and planning now in Southern California, 
which is connected, of course, to the question of how technology companies are remaking cities. Uh, um, but our version of, of testing out some of those questions has come really in the form of scooters first, with e-bikes now just coming onto the scene, and of course the larger set of questions about about autonomous vehicles. And so every um, what makes this, uh, as I mentioned, what makes this moment for thinking about how we uh, how we sketch a plan for a city or region so difficult is that. Um, the technological advances that directly affect how we move through and live in cities are happening so quickly that it is very difficult uh, from a planning point of view to keep pace. And we've seen cities all over the country already struggling to be as quick to respond um, to the implications of a, of a company like a startup like Bird dumping you know, hundreds or thousands of vehicles into their city as the startups are able to be in thinking about how they can move from place to place and, and sort of test their business model using public rights away, of course, is, of course, is the backbone of their, of their business model. So the implications for this kind of new mobility are really, uh, uh, are really key to some of the central questions that I think that you have already been engaged in. And from my, own, from my own point of view, I think it's difficult not to feel some ambivalence. I think any technology that has the ability potentially to take people out of their cars to solve some of the first mile last mile transit uh, issues that we will continue to have for a long time in Los Angeles as we build out our transit network, just given the scale of the region, um, have to be balanced against, I think, some of the anxiety that people have about what this will mean for um, the way sidewalks operate, for example, or streets. Um, and cities uh, have so far taken a whole range of approaches to thinking about how to regulate um, uh, these companies, but it's just another example of the, the kind of flux that's happening in terms of this interface of technology um, and the built spaces of the city. So this is also, um, these questions are coming at a moment when a lot of the basic questions about the relationship between mobility and housing are being brought to the fore both in planning circles and really in political conversations across uh, across the country, and I want to talk in closing just about a couple of examples of how that's playing out both locally and uh, nationally before we sit down and, and talk through some of these issues. Um, but you all are in, you know, engaged in this effort at the same time that Los Angeles has um, launched a uh, transit-oriented communities uh, program, TOC, which involve, allows um, incentives allowing greater density, greater FAR, sometimes greater height, uh, reduced parking requirements in exchange for building affordable units as part of new construction near, uh, near transit lines. It, it's, it comes out of Measure JJJ, which was passed in the fall of 2016 by LA City voters. Uh, and one of, the, um, uh, one of the elements of JJJ was um, this effort to build more affordable housing, especially when it was connected to transit and given, giving uh, builders incentives to, and, and the ability to build more densely if they were adding affordable units at several different levels. So there are four tiers um, and going up from tier one to tier four. Tier four gives the most incentives along the lines that I've just laid out. Um, and that has been a, re I think it's been, it's fair to say it's been a successful, very well subscribed program, although it's still in its early, still in its early days. But it is part of this larger conversation about how we think about the connection between um, land use and transportation. And I think a larger sense that as we see as many regions across uh, the country are seeing ridership declines in our, in our uh, public transit systems that if we don't think more carefully and thoughtfully about the relationship between land use and transit, that we're never going to see the kinds of ridership numbers that we um, are all hoping for across the country. So that has been one answer, at least from the LA City side, to this set of questions. Another set of proposals has come from Sacramento. This is State Senator Scott Wiener from San Francisco, who last year proposed a, a, a pair of bills, uh, Senate Bill 827 and 828, it was 827 that got the lion's share of the attention, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, again, thinking about in a much more aggressive way that relationship between land use and transit and proposing in the, earlier, in the earliest drafts, um, significant new height along not just uh, fixed rail, uh, but also bus lines across, LA, across the state. Um, 
And that bill, as I'm sure you know, 827 did not make it out of committee. It had um, opponents uh, from two directions. It was really um, criticized by a lot of tenants' rights and rent control advocates on the one side and on the other side of the spectrum by a lot of neighborhood homeowners association groups. So Senator Weiner has come back just this week with a new version and now has a, a new number, SB 50. Um, and it, in, it in includes a number of revisions that reflect the conversations that he's had. I would say particularly with the tenants' rights and uh, rent control, uh, affordable housing advocates side of that equation. Um, without so much uh, new consideration on, let's say, the, the homeowner slow growth side of the equation. Um, and that uh, new proposal is just being sort of rolled out in the conversations across the city, across the state, um, in cities that would be affected are, are, are just uh, beginning. It seems to me that um, there will continue to be consternation about what this bill means. Um, I should also mention that there has been a lot of progress in, in ADU construction, accessory dwelling units, or called granny flats that have made, been made possible by, really by state uh, uh, changes. And there has been a significant amount of construction of ADUs, but there is this, a lot of policy territory between um, the, the kind of volume that is produced by new ADU construction and the kinds of changes that Senator Weiner has proposed, particularly in A27, but also in SB50. And it is in that territory that a lot of the conversations about, about housing and land use will be taking place over the next year or so. So that's just to kind of frame um, the way that you all will be thinking about that and thinking about, for example, the single-family neighborhoods in, um, in Culver City. It's certainly connected to that larger conversation. And this is, as I mentioned, a conversation that's happening all over the country. And in a, and, and in a way, this, uh, these conversations that, that you're having in Culver City are very timely along these lines. And I would say, from in terms of our office, what we're watching, the cities that we're watching most carefully, along with seeing sort of measuring the reception to SB 50 in this new version of, of Senator Wiener's uh, legislation is what's happening in Seattle and what's happening in Minneapolis. So those of you who are interested in the politics of these questions, I would suggest you uh, pay attention to those two cities in particular. Seattle um, has just released its planning commission, has just released a report about the future of its single family houses, really looking at that history of redlining exclusion that really um, set some of the land use policies in those uh, and zoning questions in those neighborhoods and put them in place in the first place, and looking at the future of those neighborhoods, um, some of which, interestingly, have actually been shrinking in population um, as Seattle, um, as a whole, has really been booming population-wise in terms of investment uh, and growth, and it begins to lay out a set of recommendations for what um, a sort of new dialogue about the future of the single-family neighborhood in Seattle might look like. So I think a lot of planners have been um, paying attention to that question. I'll just read you a little bit of what that report says. Seattle's popularity and existing zoning is resulting in the construction, and some of this will sound very familiar to anyone in Southern California, um, is resulting in the construction of large, expensive new houses at a time when more people need more affordable places to live. If we are to accommodate our growing population, our city must take a fresh look at the policies that regulate the types of housing allowed in all of our neighborhoods and adapt them to align with the comp comprehensive plan's vision of vibrant communities that are economically diverse and walkable with affordable homes near parks, transit, jobs, and schools. In the absence of vacant land, and of course we face the same situation here, new housing must be integrated into the existing fabric of our neighborhoods. In our 2014 family-sized housing report, we urge the city to allow a broader range of low-density housing in single-family neighborhoods. This report takes an in-depth look at this strategy with a renewed sense of urgency. And that brings us back to the first images I said that, that I showed. I think some of that urgency comes from a broader sense of the historical patterns right, that have produced um, uh, some of this zoning in the first place, and really realizing the price that certain communities, particularly communities of color, had to pay um, as those decisions were being made and as, as cities were growing in the middle decades of the 20th century. And certainly that's at the forefront of what um, Seattle is thinking about. Now I mentioned Minneapolis. This is the last image um, that I have. Minneapolis has a new mayor who was elected on a, on a, a pretty dramatically pro-housing platform. Um, and the mayor in, in tandem with the, with the planning director 
has been working on a new blueprint for growth for Minneapolis, which is called Minneapolis, the Minneapolis 2040 plan. Um, it got quite a bit of press early on when an early draft version of that plan included um, uh, a new clause that would have allowed fourplexes in all the single family neighborhoods across the city. And that produced the kind of backlash that it would produce in Los Angeles or Culver City. It was quite controversial. And most of the coverage of the plan, at least that I was reading um, over the summer, for example, was focused on that um, a part of the plan and the backlash to it. And so my assumption, the assumption of others, was that the plan as a whole faced a really rocky path to approval. Meanwhile, the city was doing some really interesting and innovative um, engagement in neighborhoods across the city um, and was making some significant modifications um, to the plan, and it now looks like it will pass um, the, the Minneapolis City Council, although I haven't followed in the last couple of days. It was supposed to go to council, I think, this week, in fact. Um, and it includes, a, um, uh, it includes allowing triplexes in many single-family neighborhoods that meet the scale um, and height of existing single-family houses. And that is part of the equation that a lot of cities are looking at. So it's saying, if you're seeing mansionization in your neighborhood, if you're seeing building new houses that are completely out of scale with the neighborhood, and they're not uh, adding any units to um, the existing volume of housing in a city, um, is there a way to look at experiments in either duplexes or triplexes um, that would match the existing scale and, in fact, address some of the concerns that even residents and homeowners uh, who are very concerned about growth and development in their neighborhoods and in their cities would like to see, which is to say if you ask um, people who live in single-family neighborhoods what they would like to see change in those neighborhoods, they talk about a number of things consistently. And I wonder to what extent this squares with what you're hearing in Culver City. You hear people talk about wanting walkable streets and neighborhoods, uh, wanting to support local retail, for example, local meaning non-chain retail, um, the ability for folks to age in place, um, the ability for younger buyers or renters to get a foothold on the ladder of, of home ownership or moving into those neighborhoods. Um, they, they talk about uh, eyes on the street, about security, about a sense of community that can be tough to achieve in shrinking single family neighborhoods. And many of those things can actually be achieved uh, through some more flexibility in housing stock uh, and that's what Minneapolis is looking at. There are a lot of questions that come along with it. There are a lot of concerns and anxieties that come with that. Um, uh, but it will be interesting from the point of view of the West Coast to see how that plays out both politically and I would say architecturally um, as, this plan, uh, as this plan moves forward. So um, with that, I'll take us back to our, um, our first slide so that we can talk again about uh, looking ahead um, and invite the mayor and, and the councilman up there. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, I, I'd like to, to start out by, by uh, kind of moderating a discussion with these two guys. Um, the, the, uh, as I, 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 in private, get to talk with Alex a lot about these issues, and I know he has tremendous depth of knowledge about them, and I'm, I'm eager to, to hear you guys talk to each other. So, Alex, do you have any burning questions to start out with? I, I should have uh, should have prepared more. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I can I can I can I can start out with. It. I'm gonna so I'm gonna take us straight to the bottom of, of where these where these conversations usually end up. In the in the this morning this morning we had a meeting that was the beginning of our economic strategy planning process that we're starting before we do the general plan because we wanted to, as a council, we wanted to get kind of a jump on talking about economic development uh, so that it didn't lag in, because we have, you know, our economy is going very well now, we have all this development, but, uh, but there are certain places where we're a little bit worried, you know, retail downtown, as, as Christopher mentioned. Um, and this morning was, was a discussion with, between our staff and, and the consultants from, from Berkeley um, an economic strategy firm um, uh, with our our uh, our high tech sector with with folks from the Hayden Track most um, and and the discussion as I mentioned went straight to the bottom parking 
and and the the because really it was their main concern, and they were upset that that uh, they 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 want to grow, but they can't grow because there's not enough parking, and because of the expense that the, all and the cost that they're spending on parking, and and this was not theoretical. This was this was very practical. Um, so my question to you guys is that we know, I think many of us know what the urbanist future looks like. It's fewer cars, people using other forms of transit. And, you know, and Metro now has probably the largest infrastructure program in the country um, trying to build out our public transit. Um, but it's not happening fast enough. Uh, and, and, and these companies, the public transit doesn't work for them because the train only goes to the east and the west now can't get here from all the other places. So my question to you guys is, how do we get from here to there? Do we, do we, do we, and, and this is a question that will be presented here in Culver City very soon. Do we want, do we build peripheral parking and try to use a, an on-demand shuttle system or, so there it is. I make one very Culver City specific observation. <coughs> I'll start with an anecdote, which is that the last Oh, I forget how many million dollars, but the last few million dollars of our redevelopment agency's money went to a project in the Hayden Tract to build parking. <laughs> so, you know, the 20% of redevelopment money was supposed to be spent on affordable housing, and, and that's, you know, many cities' failure to do that is part of what uh, resulted in the, the termination of redevelopment agencies. Um, so we provided uh, affordable parking. We for, provided affordable housing for cars. Um, it's an interesting... It's an interesting phenomenon. You, regardless of political stripe, you will find the most Stalinist arguments in the world for um, socialized parking. You know, so, so <laughs> it's just a fact. Um, so I assume that the people in, in the Hayden Tract weren't looking to, you know, weren't offering proposals for market rate parking. They were asking for the government to provide uh, free parking. Um, it's really a strange disconnect. Um, is, at the same time, uh, some of them were spending. Uh, tens of thousands of dollars per month on parking. And, and the reason that we are so auto-dependent is, the is what, 60, 80 years of, of that choice. We spent trillions of dollars as a country to facilitate and subsidize driving. So, um, you know, how to get from here to there is very simple if there weren't a political question. Um, the, 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 the answer would be to price driving and parking uh, appropriate to what it actually costs society, um, which is you know not hard with parking. You just don't build free parking lots, um, but that's not politically palatable for people. Well, you're right that the the question in Los Angeles, as in Culver City, always comes back always comes back to parking or traffic. If it's a this question about what we're building and the scale of what we're building, but you're really right. I think you put your finger on on the the fact that we have trained drivers to think that we will continually reshape the city to make it more efficient for them. Um, and we have done that for six or seven or eight decades, right? Um, and of course people then get used to moving through the city in a certain way and continue to expect that we will do that because they have gotten used to it and they've gotten used to the, um, they have gotten used to the efficiency that, and the ease that, that can come with that, particularly as, as it relates to free parking. I think we are also beginning to realize the price we've had to pay. Um, and that price has been largely the way that the public realm has been denuded, that we have largely sort of continued to expand the space for vehicles at the expense of, of room for everyone else who uses the streets and public spaces of the city. And also that it did, it took a long time for what, you know, uh, Rainer Bannum called motordom right to be established. It took many, many decades and many, many uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and when it comes to freeway construction, largely subsidized from the federal level at a ratio, you know, the federal government was practically insisting that cities like Los Angeles build freeways in the post-war decades and paying, you know, up to 90% of the cost of that investment. And so because Los Angeles was growing so quickly after the war, it was, of course, eager uh, to, t to take that funding and, and really changed, in some ways, warped the way that the city was shaped. And so it will, we will be in a period of limbo um, as the, you know, we have a significant period of time before a mature transit system is built and we are still hashing out um, all of these questions. So I don't, I don't think that that will become suddenly less, less of a hot button issue. 
I do think that the, all of the projections that I've seen about parking demand is that sometime relatively soon, parking demand is going to decline quite precipitously. And that ha anybody who works on, city, on, this, on the city government side has to think how responsible it is it can, to continue to invest in that kind of infrastructure given what, we, what projections we're seeing. Now, what we do with existing parking is, is a separate question. So one way that we're addressing that with new construction is, is thinking about ways that parking can be, can be converted. Um, and if you're talking about underground parking or existing parking, of course, those, those, uh, you don't have the opportunity to think about that flexibility. So uh, I, think, I think we have to keep the larger historical framework in mind that we have sort of taught voters and residents to expect that the city will continue to be reshaped in this way. And we shouldn't be surprised when they bring that sort of expectation to the public process. I do actually have a constructive idea. <laughs> um, and also a quick observation, one of my favorite of your pieces, Mr. Hawthorne, was the, uh, an architectural review of the 405 freeway, which <laughs> the bottom line was that uh, if you go back to the 60s, really through the late 70s, early 80s, the freeway was seen as a triumph. Um, it was something to be proud of, and there was a coherence because they were all built. I mean, the interstate system cost over a trillion dollars. It's one of the greatest, you know, most expensive infrastructure projects in human history. Um, but now the 405 is a patchwork <coughs> because it's all been cobbled together through various efforts to patch it up uh, because it's tremendously wasteful. Freeways, the free, freeways, they, they, you know, economically it's not working. Um, and in terms of people's lives and health and time with their families, it's not working. Um, so which, which does bring us, I think, to some, a practical answer, which is that we have a booming local economy um, and uh, as Mr. Hawthorne pointed out during his presentation, the, our residential population hasn't grown uh, really in about 40 years. Um, we do have uh, somewhere in between Senator Weiner's proposal and uh, what we have today, which is a broad swath of the city, sort of a linear segment that really it doesn't have any residential uh, component, but is, is you know, warehouses and, and a sort of LA 2.0 format of you know, automobility and that's not being a desirable area. Um, we could, with some slight policy changes and some more attention to the use of the street, allow more residents. Um, it's the, that type of walkable, uh, proximate to, to creative jobs and proximate to transit. Uh, housing is really undersupplied. When you build it, rents go up because people want to live there. Um, so there's people really want that. And you could build that without parking. You could build it inexpensively without parking, and it would really also be great for local coffers. In terms of um, the urban design implications of these changes, the technological changes that in some of which I was talking about, I mean, that's really at the forefront of what we're thinking about in the Department of Transportation, LA, and planning, and the sort of nexus between DOT and, and the planning department is where a lot of the most interesting work that that I see myself doing is, is happening. And an example of that has to do with um, with parking and you know the the amount of space that we have given over in terms of the street to car storage is rapidly shifting in terms of demand on curb space to demands that will be intense in other ways but will be much um, uh, a demand for access to the curb for much less you know a shorter periods of time so instead of a car that's parked at, in one uh, parking space along the curb for you know 30 minutes or an hour or two there will be, there are all kinds of new services, whether it's Uber or Lyft or Amazon or Postmates or, you know, they want to touch the curb just for a little bit. Um, and that has really interesting implications for how we use the street, but also how the sidewalk is designed, how we think about access. The whole, I would say also the whole choreography of how we think about entrance to architecture. I mean, one of the really interesting implications of that for me as someone who's thought about the architecture of the city is that there was a moment when the front door sort of lost its importance in LA architecture and everybody knows the LA kind of architectural landmark that has a double facade where the facade facing the parking lot on the back is just as grand as the facade facing the sidewalk, sometimes even grander, right? And so the front entrance sort of fell out, fell, fell out of favor during the kind of post-war automobility motor dome years. But now we're seeing that kind of reemergence of the importance of the front door and the whole choreography of arrival across the sidewalk. So if you're coming on in a, in a lift or um, on a bird scooter, you're walking, you're taking transit, um, you're, you're going to be coming through the front door, you're going to be coming across the kind of threshold, public threshold of the sidewalk. Um, and so all of these changes have, you know, all kinds of ripple effects in terms of how we design the sidewalk in the street, for example.
one last point is that, uh, was it 10 years ago, Donald Shoup, a professor at UCLA, published a book that, again, has really simple answers to the parking question. That it's just it's just hard to get people to understand. I mean, his, his idea is basically peripheral parking um, to preserve the, the, the joy of being downtown, the walkability, the human scale, uh, price it appropriately so that you're not subsidizing people's driving, um, price the curb appropriately so that there's always a parking space on every block, and then ration residential parking with um, with a permitting system. Oh, and the final bit is you know, creating parking improvement districts where if you are charging a market, market rate, you encourage the businesses or the residents to see the value of that by reinvesting the money that comes from that parking revenue right where it's generated so that you actually build some political support for it. And Pasadena. Like the old town Pasadena model, I was going to say. Yeah. Well, please, you know better. <laughs> Great, so we went to the bottom, we've answered those questions. Um, so I'd like to go ahead and open it up to questions from the audience. Um, some of you attended some of our, our uh, community uh, discussion, community conversation events that we had last week and uh, that were very successful where it was really about hearing uh, all of our the residents in that, in that neighborhood talk and, and getting input from them. Um, but tonight, that we're, we're so lucky to have Christopher Hawthorne here, I'd like everybody to, to try and ask questions um, ra rather than make long statements. So um, please, go ahead. Um, I'd like us to think about tomorrow today. And I'd like to ask you, because I'm surprised you didn't, none of you mentioned this, but what about the future of the earth and the climate, and you talk about a lot of other things, the history of uh, the comfort of parking wherever you want, but what about appealing to people from the point of view of, you know, fossil fuels are bad? Do you think that's uh, somewhere we can get? I hope that it was clear that I find those questions absolutely central right to the future, so all of the climate projections. Um, they were reading, you can't read those reports as I've been reading over the last couple of weeks, as I'm sure it's true for so many people here, and not think that we have to change our relationship to mobility, to the automobile. And in fact, again, as many of you will know, the, the you know, we've made huge progress in our in our climate goals across the state, and the one place where we've really faced some stubborn resistance in pulling those numbers down has to do with auto emissions. Um, and so that's really where we have the most work to do. Um, and we cannot talk about any of these things without talking about climate first and foremost. So I hope that that was clear from the remarks that I made. I absolutely agree. No, but I mean, I think that is an argument. I totally agree from a political point of view. We need, when we're talking about parking and access to parking and subsidized parking and revealing the true cost of parking, another part of the cost of automobility is, has to do with climate. So I, I think that's a very good point. I appreciate that question so much. It's very great. I want to thank you for presenting it in your in your presentation, discussing it in your presentation, um, because you know twenty eight percent of our state's carbon inventory is from personal transportation, um, and we just found out in the last couple of days that uh, as a planet we've I forget it's a, we had a two percent increase in greenhouse gas emissions last year. After a couple of years of pause where people or experts were thinking maybe we were starting to turn the corner, uh, I believe they described the report as a runaway freight train. And I think in case people don't know, if you don't believe it, well, I'm sorry, but this is, you know, we're all going to operate on what the scientists say. Um, the, ex the, the guidance is that we need to get our greenhouse gas emissions to 45% of the levels they were in 2010 by 2030. So I just want to let that sink in for a second. We need to have almost half worldwide the fossil, f the the greenhouse gas emissions, 11 years from now, that we had eight years ago. So that's a tall order. And sometimes I just I I, I get scared. I get very very concerned. I've got little kids. They will see calamitous climate breakdown in their lifetime if we don't meet this challenge. Um, and I see the discussions about development or about parking or about you know traffic. And they are just, you know, they're important. They're quality of life issues, um, but but they ignore solutions that improve would improve quality of life beyond where we're at. You know, the idea of breaking through the mold um, that actually address climate change. I also think, you know, this question of this limbo period that you mentioned at the beginning, um, 
is really important in terms of this this conversation because we will, you know, the expansion of the metro net, network will continue to make transit, you know, incrementally more competitive with driving over time. And eventually we're going to get to a place where it's competitive and it's more attractive just in terms of time, which is really a tipping point for really, you know, massive transit use in any city that you study. The good news is that from an electoral point of view, I think from a political point of view, we have regional consensus about investment in transit. So if you look at Measure M, you know, these, these transit uh, measures that require a supermajority you know, um, I don't know what the final tally on Measure M was, it was 71% or right around there, right? And that is a remarkable sort of expression uh, of electoral support. We don't have, I think it's also important to say that we do not have that kind of consensus on housing policy. So if I had to put this big conversation in a nutshell, it's that we've reached a kind of consensus about investing in transit as a region, and that has been consistently expressed at the ballot box. We have a much, you know, sort of, um, a, a less clear picture in terms of uh, what the electorate thinks about housing, housing policy, and it seems to change uh, by the election. So, so I have a question, um, and you had mentioned that in the last two years, there's been obviously an uptick. I think Alex, you had mentioned that in terms of the amount of greenhouse gases and emissions. And when, that, when I listened to that report and that first came out, I didn't find that surprising at all because in the last several years, the intensity of use that I'm seeing in my daily life, everybody having everything delivered, and the flexibility of folks, um, I think they did this in the Bay Area with Amazon, that you could use your own car to deliver and this the certain level of I guess e-commerce and Uber and Lyft and I think the intentions are are meant for something else but I think the reality in the last two years I've seen it I've seen it in the markets I've seen it you know you go to a restaurant and the postmates and the all and there's three people sitting there and there are hundreds of orders coming in and the kitchen's stressed. So that seems to be part of the a wave of the future that is affecting the greenhouse gases tremendously. So I know there's a question so in there the, somewhere. The question is, is there a report in the last two years on where those gases are coming from or where they think? Thank you, Thomas. I think it's part of making the true costs of these services, you know, explicit to folks. And it's very easy to have the illusion that when the Postmates arrives that it's sort of magically not being driven to your door and you're not having to go out so therefore it's not generating a trip. And of course this is the sort of worst case scenario of, auto, of uh, autonomous vehicles too, right? If you imagine in the, in the worst case land use scenario, if you can live um, out on the periphery of a metropolitan region and you can sleep on your way to work because you're being driven in by your autonomous vehicle and then you can, because you know there's a parking space in your driveway, send your autonomous vehicle back to your house once you get to your job and then you were talking about four trips every day instead of two, right? So there's some larger policy questions um, and I think traffic volume is a big, I'm, I'm interested in whether you're talking about how this relates to work schedules, for example. Um, because the, one of the most interesting studies about the traffic during the 84 Olympics, which of course everybody remembers as being magically free-flowing, is that the volume of cars, from what I understand, was uh, the volume of traffic was essentially the same as a typical day. It was just distributed more evenly across the day. And so a change in work schedules, a certain amount of people who work from home, for example, or working on a different schedule, that kind of tweak to you know relatively small percentage of the workforce could... I'm just wondering if you're looking at those kinds of studies or having conversations with the employers in town. We are. We're doing, I mean, I, we, we've just done some traffic studies, particularly in the Hayden Tract, and, and I'm not sure if we can extract it in that granular way, but it is, it is a very interesting question that we talk about because certainly those employers uh, often talk about how their employees don't work on a regular schedule, and yet at the same time, when we look at the shuttles that we need, we talk about the peaks. Uh, and, and, and it's the peaks where we get the most, uh, you know, the most uh, 
protest from from the neighborhoods, particularly Alex's um, <laughs> that, that about about how jammed up the streets get. It's a great neighborhood. My name is a great neighborhood. Uh, really quickly to answer Marla's question to the extent I can, there is a uh, the California Air Resources Board puts out an annual detailed uh, car, uh, greenhouse gas inventory that spells out in pretty good detail where where most of these uh, most of our emissions come from. And as as California has done quite well with cap and trade and uh, and greenhouse gases from electrical generation have gone down, 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 down. Transportation has has grown ever larger. And a really quick aside on the architectural implications of that, I have a friend who's an architect who's doing a couple of residential uh, large-scale multifamily projects in Los Angeles, and he told me that one thing that's happening in certain neighborhoods is that they're, because of the Amazon effect, um, the mail rooms in these apartment buildings are shrinking and are barely non-existent, and the room for Amazon packages is growing and not just a place for the packages to be delivered but also a place to pile up all the all the cardboard after they've all been opened of course um, and so that's just a kind of architectural reflection of, of all of these changes that are happening in terms of consumption Hi. Um, along those lines have you guys engaged um, employers specifically about if the corporation businesses about changing their culture around work from home working at, you know, different hours, that sort of thing. I think that a lot of the new tech companies especially are pretty savvy as far as using new technology to really uh, keep the business running operationally. But I think that's part of where I see at least a place where a lot of us are stuck, kind of, well, not mis well, myself, but I found a lot of colleagues when I was working in Century City were driving two hours both ways to get to um, our offices, and that in and of itself is pretty useful. And so it's a, it's a lifestyle that everyone has to maintain. You have to live two hours away to be able to, you know, to support your family and have a, have a certain lifestyle. But I feel like um, I think this whole idea of like living, building community, building cities for communities makes a lot of sense. But it also requires kind of the business and and the other side of that to kind of... If I can just say really quickly, I think, you know, our planning department has done a good job over the years of, of starting to work on transportation demand management. That, that's sort of, I think, where that question lands. And, I, and we will continue. That's a big part of, I think, what we're doing over the next several years. And also the historical roots of this, again, are important to think about. There, there are many reasons that cities like Culver City and Santa Monica have made a bet in favor of, of um, welcoming employment growth and not housing growth. One of the reasons, of course, is Proposition 13 and the, and the fact that uh, property tax revenue uh, uh, was just made it a different equation in terms, of, in terms of building more housing versus attracting more job growth. And so that has, in a region as spread out as ours, that has really significant implications for how many people how far people are moving from home to work um, given, I mean, you look at the population numbers of San, not just Culver City, Santa Monica has essentially been flat for 40, for 40 years while the employment numbers have really mushroomed. So that has direct impacts on traffic. So I have a question about um, mass transit. Has there been much discussion on how to make it more family friendly? user friendly because I find like with e-bikes I was out the other day and I've never seen an e-bike with a child seat on it. Um, it's, it just doesn't exist when you see all the metro bikes around. So I have four children. Um, also just taking the train becomes a very expensive undertaking when all six of us um, are traveling by train and then the other thing is um, bike, dedicated bike cars on the trains. Um, we once tried to go to Ciclavia and it was very traumatic <laughs> with six people and four of them being little people. And we huffed through it, but it would have been so much nicer if there was a dedicated car for bicycle riders so we could all just go and we didn't have to uh, fight. I think it's a great point. I have, I have two girls and we also took our bikes on the train for the last Ciclavia and had the same experience um, and had bikes, little bikes falling on little people the whole time. Um, and also, I will say, I had an experience tonight, um, you know, with, with my t t coming over in the expo line, um, having long, you know, kind of a law enforcement presence checking tap cards, 
And I also happened to have gotten one of those infamous jaywalking tickets before the law got changed when I was walking with the light and, you know, with the countdown hand. And that's now a law that's been changed. But I, it just made me think that the engagement that we have with law enforcement as pedestrians and transit riders is can be much more intense than we have as drivers. I've run through red lights like I'm sure everybody has. I've, I've never been pulled over in Los Angeles. I've never had any engagement with law enforcement as a driver. I've had a whole bunch as a transit rider and a pedestrian. And I think that's something we have to think about. Um, and and it has to do with you know how friend, you know how family friendly that feels. They just the, the experience again to go back to the point we were making earlier about the way in which the city has been remade to make life easier for drivers and all of the ways in which there are little tiny ways in which it continues to be difficult or little indignities that face um, people who are getting around the region in a different way. So I think we can you know have to keep thinking and talking about those issues. And I, I do have to say that we have we have kind of a, a beacon of light in in Christopher's ingenious colleague Salita Reynolds, the who's the head of, of the LA Department of Transportation, who every time she speaks talks about uh, what if transit were designed for a single mom and her daughter, and that's that's the way it has to be. If it works for her, works for them, it'll work for everybody. And and this is something that I I hope to to get to inform our entire planning process here in Culver City. And I think to think, just to think about a kind of audit of what it's like for you know, families with children or older people to move through these spaces that we're designing. I have a friend, fellow architecture critic named Alexandra Lang, who works in New York, and she has a new book called The Design of Childhood, which is about cities and um, the kind of history of spaces made for children. Fascinating book, which I recommend. But I've been thinking I would love to bring her out and do just to kind of you know, have her look at Los Angeles through the eyes of someone who's been thinking about those issues. And of course, you could do the same thing with thinking about how approachable and, and workable a city is for, um, you know, for, for older residents, et cetera, people with all kinds of physical challenges and thinking about what kind of messages the design of the spaces is sending. We have time for another couple of concise questions. Um, my question is about uh, kind of conflicting jurisdictions. And uh, I, I really believe in our city council. I think they're really on the right track and they're doing their best. But so many um, entities make up the laws and re regulations of our state. Um, how do you negotiate this whole thing and get things to happen in a timely manner when you have to go so many levels of bureaucracy? Sure, I've got the answer there. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, one, one answer just really quick is, is that I feel so lucky to have Christopher because we, we, we're talking about these things. We're talking about, he has brought up to me uh, a discussion about the border condition between Los Angeles and Culver City. Whereas, you know, the Cumulus Project, which I am hopeful will add to our area and not detract from it, was really done without any discussion with us at all. It's a great question. It's, you know, I'm new here, so <laughs> I'm still working on that. But, um, you know, I think all of us are probably, I know my colleagues are very involved in the regional, uh, you know, the, the COGS, the uh, Council of Governments. Um, we, uh, we're lucky to have really responsive, really uh, competent legislators at every level. And I've, you know, I know each of them. So, when things come up, I can at least try. You know, they have uh, much bigger plates than, than I do, and I just try to try to make sure our issues are front and center. I think this question of regional coordination is absolutely crucial, but really tricky. I mean, two of the most famous books about the built environment and planning history of Los Angeles are called The Reluctant Metropolis and The Fragmented Metropolis, to give you an idea of how long this has been an issue. And it has some really interesting, deep historical roots. There was a sense, some people who came and helped down modern Los Angeles in the late 19th and early 20th centuries were coming from cities like Chicago and New York where machine politics were really the order of the day. And they actually, for some of them, it was appealing to have that kind of um, separate government that where city and county were not contiguous, for example, and machine politics might be more difficult to put in place. But it's also been an accident of geography and just the way that, that governance has grown up over the years. So now we have, um, you know, from my point of view, thinking about the city, not only the, the individual 15 council districts within the city of LA, um, but then the city, the, its relationship to the county, its relationship to Metro, LAUSD is a separate entity. 
etc. I was just reading a piece by three leaders of regional planning organizations in everywhere but Los Angeles, and Los Angeles was notable for its absence, so it was by um, the leader of SPUR in San Francisco, which is a um, hundred-year-old planning advocacy group, a uh, similar group in Chicago, and the Regional Plan Association in New York. We don't really have an equivalent, so th to the extent that SCAG and other regional attempts, you know, there is a conversation happening, we have a deficit there, we have complexity there that other regions don't have to deal with, and, um, and that makes all of these decisions uh, difficult, which is why, you know, I think there's been a little bit of a, a improvement in the city council, the city and county, LA, LA county relationship in terms of governance, and so I think we're moving in the right direction, but this is a historically a very tricky area. Just really quickly throw out one other thing, which is the, I figured it's SB 50 or 35, um, created several years ago sustainable communities plans um, at the SCAG level, that's the Southern California Area Governments um, or Association of Governments. I think that there's promise there. Basically, it just is a planning a, a planning thing without any teeth at the moment, but I, I suspect that over time that will emerge as a more powerful uh, center of planning activity across jurisdictions. Um, speaking of regional uh, collaboration, this city council is working on making the largest urban oil field in the United States, the Ur Inglewood oil field, into the central park of the West. And so, as we imagine this together and work hard as a small city, I'm just wondering if you, if we can think about LA being a part of this larger discussion and what that would mean for the region. We certainly have a lot to learn from the LA side uh, from those efforts. I'm one of the one of the sites I've been working on is the G2 parcel, the old Taylor Yard section on the LA River that the city purchased, 42 acre site that the city purchased last year. It has significant environmental remediation given its history as a whale yard uh, run by Union Pacific. And so these questions about open space, all of the open, large scale open spaces that are left or convertible, almost always this gets back to my point about sort of fraud and layered history. A lot of that is environmental history that's very complex. Uh, and we sort of have this notion of open space sort of being carved out of beautiful green meadows that are you know, environmentally perfect. But almost every large scale site that we're assembling or trying to convert into open space has this this kind of history. That's why it's available to us, or that's why it hasn't been developed in one way or another. Um, and so it's a it's a question that I'm really I'm keenly interested in. I'm also very interested in the future of the gas station. Just as a small tangent, um, as gas goes away, electrification uh, accelerates. There's a the question of what um, the charging station of the future will look like, whether it will have a kind of public space or retail component. And the other side of that is what we do to think about a coherent strategy for gas stations from a land use point of view, because so many of them occupy really important corner sites. And so there's really diverse ownership, of course. But for those owners who are interested in being proactive about conversion, ultimately, there is that significant remediation piece that has to be thought of. And could those be spots for housing? You know, there's so many in, in some environmentally, economically challenged neighborhoods. Uh, uh, intersections where three or even four of the corners are occupied by gas stations and as we think about new places, new, new sites and new strategies for housing, for example, it has to be part of the conversation, but, but that brings all of those really complicated questions to bear. And it's particularly, of course, uh, difficult here given the intensity of, you know, the, the, uh, and reach of the oil business across the region. I think, I think we're over time, but I'm going to take one more good question. Oh, I, I see a few of them there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so it's about education, so I don't know if you'll be able to answer it, and then if not, we can leave. The, the question is, uh, we face the potential of increasing population. Um, the school district faces the potential of increasing enrollment, and so we have a bunch of questions around um, our facilities, including teacher housing, which is a totally unmet need, but then also um, building our educational facilities for increasing enrollment and changing um, educational pedagogy and so forth. So have you seen any innovation that's worth talking about in this moment re related to educational spaces, both for living of staff and then the students themselves? You want to answer that locally, and then I have some thoughts about the, the larger... I mean, I'm very interested in the cities, and there are a couple, and I wish LA were further along in this conversation that are looking at um, um, the amount of property that many school districts own 
as a potential site for workforce housing, teachers first, of course, but affordable housing in a broader sense. Uh, and I think the same conversations begin beginning to happen with churches, because that's another a set of institutions that have uh, a lot of land, much of it dedicated now to parking, often in the, in the church equation, see housing, particularly affordable housing, as, as connected to their mission and their role in the community already. So that seems like a natural partnership to me. Uh, I think we have to be sort of turning over every rock in this effort to find new places to build housing, given the deficit that we're facing, you know, the most recent studies are that across LA County we have a deficit of about a million housing units based on what we should have built to keep up with population over the last three decades, four decades since the slow growth movement of the, of the 80s. So I think the um, school conversation is uh, we have to be thinking about th those sites for housing. And then, and then about you know architecture of schools, that's something I've, I've written a fair amount about. I wrote a lot about the LAUSD building campaign, which to me was very disappointing architecturally. Um, and so I've been trying and trying to think more positively. I've been looking at the library campaign, which alternately I think was very successful in producing the, the um, branch libraries across um, the city and region that really were ambitious architecturally, but also really reflective of, of their communities. And uh, and that was a program that I think that, that has some lessons for these large scale building campaigns. And then you know I just think the message. Even kindergartners, I think kids are very attuned to the message that uh, the architecture of the faci school facilities is sending them. And my main disappointment with some of the LASD projects that were built very quickly um, was that it was sending a message that we, you know, that we don't necessarily want to send about how much we're investing in, in, in the architecture that you know we're, we're using to educate children. So um, I'm trying to look at examples where big institutions like the library, for example, have been really good forward-looking architectural clients and sort of apply those to the um, other questions that we're looking at in terms of housing. The only little bit I'd add very quickly is that on the financial part and uh, sort of the inclusion part is that I think that it is possible to build, uh, to accommodate new neighbors in a way that is um, financially productive for the city despite Prop 13, basically focusing on reducing the public investment to support those spaces. I mean, there's a way to organize cities. You can go to Vancouver, for example, or you know, lots of places in Europe and see places where the ratio between private activity, uh, the business of life, and the public policing, fire department, and road maintenance is vastly different. We have, uh, you know, roughly in LA County, maybe it's just LA City, Manhattan-sized uh, area that's just surface parking. I mean, that's unproductive. It's wasting space. I think you can house more people, have more neighbors in a way that generates tremendous wealth and can help, you know, hopefully at some place further down the line um, can really help the schools. And I think, you know, I often hear, well, if we're talking about new population, how are we going to deal with that in the schools? I would just observe that we have one of the better school districts in the area. And um, to flip that question around sort of it sounds a little bit unfortunately like that color of law slide at the very beginning. I think we have an obligation to educate uh, more children in this great school district we have. So that's not what you asked, Kelly. I don't mean to imply that you were you know, making that exclusionary point, but I did want to kind of riff on that. And in fact, one of the big question marks about SB 50 um, that I would say awaits some refinement is that it now calls for some increased density away from transit in job-rich is the language so far, job-rich neighborhoods and neighborhoods with high-performing schools. Um, and so that's a significant shift from the last version. And I think there's still a lot of questions. We certainly have questions about precisely what that would mean for Los Angeles, and I'm sure that's true for Culver City. All right, Ron, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> this is what's good about a smaller city that you can call everybody, the mayor can call people by name in the back of the room. And, and, and no one's openly it has that way in Los Angeles. Yeah. No one's openly. He, Thomas knows I'm going to ask a question that's interesting and stimulating, but I actually have two, but they're quick. quick. Um, the first is I wanted to say that um, I think that um, part of this discussion is really thinking about Culver City as a, separate, as a city within a city. So part of this planning process should really be thinking about Culver City and locality and, and centralness and what elements Culver City can create that are gonna keep people in the community, whether they're working or living or um, coming for, for commerce. But 
so that's part of it. The other question, or the other thing I wanted to say was, um, and I forgot it. <laughs> um, anyway, I'll I'll leave it at that. I I can't remember the other question at the moment. I think that image of a of a you know the city within the metropolis is 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 a fantastic image to close on. Um, the you know, I just I feel so lucky to be in this little city where where we are we are able to to have an influence in our future and, and, and we're able to plan it. And I feel so fortunate to have Christopher Hawthorne here to help us with that. And and I'm I'm thrilled about being being able to engage with him closely over these next couple of years as we as we go into this. So please give him a huge round of applause and encouragement. Thanks so much, everybody, for being here. Thank and thanks to, to Jim Limbaugh in the back for, well, the president of the college, for welcoming us here to this auditorium.